find a coping mechanism to to get through the days and yeah, you just cope differently. It's yeah. very hard. And try to parent. Yeah, I'll try and make him proud. That's my thing. Thank you so much. I'm really struggling here. I'm sitting like that for two seconds to be fine. Careful though, because he's put right hypno on that. <laughs> Go on then, boy. Stick it in the body and I'll Mate, I've got emotional many times. You know, oh, what have you done? <laughs> oh, no. Big D strikes again. Welcome to another episode of the Powerful Lives podcast. Today, we've got our friend, Daniela Westbrook. Being left with nothing from my marriage and moving my kids into a bed sit this year was really difficult. Being a drug addict, you do bring a lot of stuff on yourself because you've always had a relationship with drugs before you've had a relationship with anything else. For me personally, I've made a lot of mistakes. I put my hands up. I said, you know what, I did that. I relapsed because I wanted to. I had my, all my top teeth out and implants put in on screws. It started to swell that would give me septicemia. A whole lot of it just spelled me into a depression coming out of Big Brother. should have been my busiest year when you relapse and you take drugs you don't see that yeah all you see is selfishness and a way out yes yeah, so i'm happy i'm doing some bits and you know um i've got some very good friends around me i can't complain the british public are great with me you're so honest i'm too honest sometimes i think that's my problem but yeah it's a pleasure thank you for having me in. i'm excited to be here boys absolute pleasure one of my uh, and i'll get it out of the way now one of my very first crushes as well is so, it really? 100%. And Ray Winston truth. was one of mine. There you go, see? It's meant see to happen. I mean? yeah. meant to happen. I bet you're as let down as I am. Oh, I'm yeah, joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's oh, nice to have you. See you later. Nice. <laughs> oh, really, really that you said that. Oh. There we okay. go. Get it out in the open now. It's another yeah. embarrassment. We all know each other now. It's done. That's it. Okay. Yeah. It's all weird. Oh. Oh, I feel a bit awkward. I feel like I feel a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, we'd love to um, just sort of take you back to the beginning, really, and get your life story where you, be, you know, sort of where it, it all really began up to now and what you're up to now. We're going to sort of take you through the whole journey, if that's good. Well, that's a lot of years, you know that. Oh, no, yeah. Not a lot of years. Um, well, I started off in the industry when I was nine. Um, wow. Yeah, nine years old. My mum worked in the West End with Balbon, like the bunny, bunny girls and all that sort of thing. And um, she used to have quite a good clientele there, like the Who... Roger Daltrey, all sorts of different sorts of people coming in all the time. Somebody wanted um, someone for their pop video. And my mum was a proud mum. Well, my little girl could do that. And obviously I did. I got, got into it and got into Sylvia Young's. And that was it. I just loved it. It's always been a bit of a dream, but I loved it. I wasn't very good at anything. But I loved it. I loved all the dressing up and the makeup and the photo shoots and all that sort of stuff. And anything to get a day off school. I loved it. So, yeah, I started off at nine and went full time at Sylvia's when I was 12. Oh my god! Nice, nice. My, John, my daughter's nine now. My my youngest, and it's the path that she really wants to go down. She's um she just filmed the first. She just filmed a Tesla advert, wow. which I don't know if I meant to say that or not, but I just did. But um, right. it down, yeah, it? yeah. But um, yeah, it's her dream, you know. So if you should dream at that age, you'll get there because it was for me. Um, and there was a lot of people I went to school with that were a lot more talented, a million million times more talented than me. Um. <coughs> And it weren't really their dream. They were there because they could be there, I suppose. It wasn't really a hardship for their parents to send them to that school. It was what they wanted to do at the time. Whereas in me, I worked to go to school. So, I mean, I had to put my, put my money that I earned in with my parents' money. And, you know, it didn't come easy for us. We weren't poor, but it didn't come easy for us to find school fees. People asked didn't have private school or education. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I felt I really, really wanted it. And I, <laughs> you're going to hate me for this one. I sort of manifested it, I think, in a way. From a young kid, I just dreamt it. I saw myself always doing it, doing it, being on TV, like being in Mini Pops, I did that, being on Great Jill, did that, being in EastEnders, did that. And it just sort of went from there, and I had a great time at Sylvia Young's as a kid. But it was very different. Oh, well, all old people say this, but it was a very different time then. Mm. You know, it, it was a very smaller London, a very smaller world, if you like, but we lived in. We didn't have the internet, and we didn't have people looking at our life 24-7 or... We didn't have a phone. I used to just go to the phone box and ring my mum. I'm at the station. Can you pick me up? Yeah. You know, it was a very, very... Simpler time. Simpler time. Yeah. Much more simpler. And um, I think we needed less in life, you know? 100%, yeah. But then I'd imagine, to be fair, like trying to break into... I mean, now, like you said, you can do... I've seen people on social media. They've got <laughs> highlight reels. They've got kind of little portfolios they've put together on social media. Back then, there, was, there wasn't there was that information, was there? You had to go like to a school. 
Yeah, you can do a show reels and stuff, and yeah. you, had, you had to get your equity card, obviously. Yeah. And you had Spotlight, which I've actually just rejoined now after God knows like twenty odd years. Um, but you had to have like an agent, and you had to be in no. And Sylvia Youngs was the biggest her and Anna Shear were the biggest agents, probably still alive, even though Anna Shear's just passed away. But um, the most well known children, child agents, and schools there were. You know, so to be put, to be homegrown through Sylvia Young is, is a privilege for me. You know, and a lot of people I went to school with um, are still my bestest friends now because they knew me from a little girl to a 50-year-old woman before EastEnders, before drugs, before fame, before anything, just me. Um, you know, when anything goes wrong, they're the first people on Facebook just to pop up and say, everything all right, Dan? Need anything? Or, you know, give me a text or whatever. That means a lot to me. Cause they're there for the right reasons. They're doing it because they care about me, not to find out what's going on. Or, you know, I'm not saying that everybody's like that, but there are a lot of people that are like that in life. Um, and there were also most of the people that are from my school days are the ones that are really not into that social media so much. They do Facebook and check in with each other, but they've got lives. And that sounds really horrible, but everybody, this, everybody in this day and age wants to be someone. Yeah. You know, everyone's a model, or everyone's this, or everyone's that, or everyone's Instagrammable. But it's actually harder now to get famous than what it was then. Everybody wants to be famous. Everyone can buy their views or buy their buy their followers and buy all that sort of stuff. And you could anyone could get on TV because these Love Island shows and stuff like that. It's very easy to go on TV, but um, it's actually harder to get cast in something properly yeah. now because of because of you know fame. Fame's of changed. Through TV, yeah. yeah. Well, what do you class as fame? That, exactly was, that. Yeah. Because my son, my son showed me something the other night on Instagram with some fella that. Or some kid that swallows his dinner in one bite. He Ew. literally has one bite and he swallows it like a sausage. He just has one bite, swallows it straight away. What have you been it. watching on the internet, mate? Right, <laughs> just type in sausage swallowing, <laughs> sausage swallowing. It comes up, you know what I mean? But, um, but he does, he has one bite of his dinner and swallows it. Now, this lad, he's got so many thousand followers. Is this that Bevo? Yeah. Who? Bevo. That's it, Bevo. Yeah. Bevo. What the hell? One bite. Swallows his food, half chokes to death, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, he's so, he's so famous." His parents must be so proud. So proud. His his mum, I think, she was it's quite good at that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she really, yeah, she it from far from that tree. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that's where the skills paid the bills yeah. came from. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, now he's doing the same. Yeah, but no. So I get what you're saying, you know. And I suppose going back to you saying you still got the same kind of friends. Uh -huh. I suppose there's that grounding there, isn't there? That sort of togetherness. Uh, it's taken me a long time to actually grasp that and and get over the embarrassment I think sometimes of reaching out to them because I think I was embarrassed to reach out to them because I've gone so far on the other side of the spectrum with the drug using the drugs and the done so many things to go back to them all and they're like why, why would you feel like that so I sort of left you all behind and did that and then I was embarrassed I couldn't come back to you and, you know, and they're like no you can always we're always here which is lovely which is lovely, it's, lovely. Yeah. it's very nice but um you know, it's it's making amends to people, I suppose. It's like we're doing the steps before the lines. It's like you're making amends and sometimes you've got to make amends to people and you don't really want to hear what they've got to say, but you have to because otherwise you can't mm -hmm. fully grasp your wrongs, if you get me. Um, so, yeah, I've been very lucky with that and I've, I'm have i glad. I'm glad I've learned that because I spent so long not, not um, wanting to look at that. At all and looking at everything else that was glittering and shiny around me, or anyone else that blow smoke up my arse, or you know, to do that rather than having to look at myself. My ego, my ego was killing me. It was killing me. Um, whereas if I just dropped it all and just breathed from here and realised I weren't all that important, I just asked for a bit of help. It was right there. Yeah. You know, like for many years I said, "Oh, my family don't talk to me," or this. I fell out. With it. it was always there. It was me that wasn't. You pulled away. It was me that wasn't there, you know what I mean? And we were talking about this in the car, actually, coming from the station over, saying, you know, for a long, long time, it was um, without realising I was alienating my mates. I did. At 16, I was in EastEnders. 17, my best mate, Ginny, is still my best mate today, from first day of school, from five years old to now I'm 50. It's 30 or five years, whatever, friendship or whatever, longer than that, 45 years. 45, friendship, yeah. yeah. Still my best mate. Even the other week at my dad's funeral, as I got out of the car for the funeral, she's standing there. What do you need me to do? She's come here. She's there. Yeah. She's family. Um, she knows me better than I know me. Um, 
she, I used to ring her and say, "Ring her on mum's phone. Uh, can, I, can I speak to Ginny? Because we didn't have mobiles back then. She didn't come out with me tonight. I'm going to this thing with George Michael tonight. She goes, Dan, I can't. I've got college in the morning. Just come up, come up. I said, come, please come up. I go, I'll ask your mum, lend you a tenner for the petrol. I'll give it to you when you get here. I'm not going there with wire edge mushroom fiesta. She used to go. <laughs> <laughs> she had a wire edge mushroom fiesta. I loved it. We got caught by Rod Stewart once at the roundabout in Epping singing along to If You Want My Body. And he was next to us in a Ferrari like that, just looking. You know, like, proper rocking out that way to us. But no, we was, loved it. And, um, yeah, she was like, I can't, I can't do that. And I sort of, like, we'd go out to the country club or wherever we was going, or the Ritzy in Tottenham, wherever it was. And Ed will go to a three o'clock, yeah, cab home. Could stop at, stop at the castle, mad at us, get a bacon bagel and go home. I'd be like, where are we going now? Like, just go home. Yeah. I couldn't just go home. I was just... No off switch. An addict, it was in me. It was in me from day one. And, um, <clears throat> I was just different. Different to other people, and you know, different in a way of. Not, I wasn't happy with who I was. I think I was looking for something all the time. I think that's why when I went to stage school, I loved it so much because I could be anything I wanted to be, rather than look at myself. So yeah, it's taken me fifty years to work some of them things out. But still getting there. I mean, I, I can remember at one time, like that Daniela Daniela Westbrook's name was was everywhere. All yeah. the magazines, all the papers, all the. But what I meant was, yeah. when you talk about having those, having friends that you're still friends with now, obviously, if you've got someone that is kind of, as I said, you was everywhere. I remember seeing you everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. everywhere. Um, it must be quite hard as well to, st- for for the friends to stay up with that sort of lifestyle because they, they just couldn't. Could exactly they? Can't stay Jeez, so can't stop paying for me to do things. Stop. I said, but I wouldn't be there, I wouldn't see it with me, you know. She's like, then I've got to go to work, I've got things to do. She worked for Giorgio in Selfridges, I did perfume counter, Giorgio Beverly Hills. She worked for them for a little while, and then she worked at the mobile phone shop, then she had a pie mash shop, she's supposed to be the best mate in the world, and uh, she's, I just wanted her there. She's my mate, you know, I wanted her there. I didn't want, if I'd be real, I didn't want to be with someone, whoever it might be, you know, Melissa from Neighbours, or whatever, <coughs> lovely she is. Mm. I wanted my mate with me. Oh God, no, no, no! That sounds like you know. Cause you still do that when you're famous. You go, oh my God, there's so and so. There's, there's Jordan on me. I'm excited. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I've like, excited things. You can't do that when you're with somebody else that's on the telly. You look like Wally. But with your best mate, you could go have a look. Can't help yourself. She's wearing. Have a look. <laughs> 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 it's only Patsy from Patsy. Yeah, excited. But no, I sort of lost touch of of all of them. And uh, they're all been my my biggest cheerleaders from from afar, really. I've been there to pick up the pieces many, many times. Her and my other best friend, Legs, Cousin Legs, Stuart. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I'd do without the three of them three people in my life. I really wouldn't. And in my children's lives as well. Nice. Thing. Yeah, really very lucky. My One of my best friends, Stuart, married uh, our mate, Kaz, when they were 19, and still together. And um, they're my best friends, they're my family as well, and my kids' family, so... I'm very lucky to have that. Some people don't have anyone. And um, I have a lot outside of the industry. But I never saw it before. I think I was scared to not see it. A bit blinded by the lights. Yeah, I think <sighs> addiction is addiction. But the most addictive thing ever is fame. Once you've had it, a lot of people want it, don't know what to do with it once they've got it. When they lose it, they're suicidal. They you know, don't know what to do with it. And then how to keep it. Or how to chase it. Or how... And it's horrible. It's like it's like heroin for, for for some people, you know. And it was for me for a long time. I just I had to stay famous. Like you said, I used to be everywhere. That was normal to me when I was eighteen, nineteen. It was, Channel Four was just being launched. We had four channels, people, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, not four hundred and forty-four channels. Eh? No on demand. Um, or yeah, no on demand. To you, no Dave. Netflix. No subscribing. <laughs> no nothing. Just extenders <laughs> twice a week and on a Sunday at two o'clock. And uh, <laughs> that was it. That's all we had. And um, yeah, we grew up. Sid and I. I love dearly. I spoke to him Saturday night. I said, it's Ricky. Um, we grew up in front of the nation, really. Ricky and Sam, one of my runaways, got married and told uh, underage sex and then under child bride and all that sort of stuff. And then set, uh, modeling and top as well. All the things, Bill and Grant, two big brothers chasing around. And then all the, all the mad things, all the big storylines we had. It was a lot, really, for our age. And then at weekends, we'd be off doing PAs up and down the country. Different clubs, like one Friday night we did two, Saturday night we did two. You know, it was crazy. We just worked six, seven days a week, but we loved it. 
and then was always in the papers. And I remember we used to be falling out of Cafe de Perry. Uh, all our sins, Cafe de Perry or Legends. And uh, <laughs> right outside Cafe de Perry was the man that used to, used to sell the newspapers. There used to be newspaper stands back then. And I remember one night I went to come out in there and the big door and Donna just went, no, 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 I just threw a blanket straight over me and Sid. Literally, one picked by me up, one picked Sid up, threw blankets over us, threw us in the back of this car, our car, our driver. And then threw, all I could feel was things flying at me. Door slammed and that was it. We got around the corner and said, but what the fuck is going on here? He went, oh my God, it was like the news of the world. Well, Suddenly it was front page of every paper. Yeah. But we was like, oh, I left this local, got to work tomorrow, we're in trouble. You know, and that was how it was. You, you just was on the front page of every paper. And for as quick as you was the nation's sweetheart, you was the na- nation's baddie as well. So from hero to zero, it was like really hard, very hard to take. I mean, the, the papers do seem to have that relationship with a lot of people anyway, don't they? I mean, they seem to like you, if I'm honest, the papers, but that then you sell, it's you sell papers. I sell papers and also know that I, I can't just have a level of things are running good. You know, you can't just say, yeah, things are great and when they're not, can you please give me some privacy? No, they've done well that way when you sold to sell a million times selling everything you've done. It's a story. But these, this day and age, they're a lot, lot more tame, a lot more easier on people. I mean, they used to sit outside my mum's house for days with the old, um, do you remember the old um, telephone hut things they used to have outside yeah. work? Yeah, it's what they called? Um, like the little tents? Ellie, yeah, not what Ellie, whatever they called, the little telephone people. Yeah, little orange and yeah. white tents. You used to sit in them. Sit in them, like sit there. Sit in, they tended to be working on the road. Like old Bill, they'd sit there like literally like looking to see what they could get and like taking pictures and long lenses and they're awful. Absolutely awful. They're not like that today. Only because most celebrities now ring them and tell them where they're going so they get their pap shots done and they get paid for them, whatever. But it's different. And also there's a fine line that they can cross. They have to give you a 6pm the night before, but contact you before 6 the night before for a right to reply if they're running a story. They have to. They never used to. Let's just run it. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Run it. And that was it, yeah. Back in the work days of the news of the world and you know, the red tops, that was it was proper hacks. Proper hacks back then. They did they you're so right about the media as well because I remember them building everything up and everything was lovely and sweet and beautiful and this and that and then I suppose the moment it wasn't in their favour or it it wasn't selling, they then kind of the smallest thing they were on <coughs> it, but it was everywhere. I think it they were they did build us up, we did do it or the thing that fucked it up was us, it was me. Taking drugs, so I mean, I'm fine that other than that I'd be like like Catherine Zeta Jones at that time, similar thing. Nation sweetheart, you know, you would have been fine. I wasn't, I was who I am. You know, I found Coke and I was addicted and that was it for me. It was a shame I'm an addict, but that's that's with my DNA, it's who I am. Um and it yeah, it was it wasn't them, it wasn't the press's fault as such. They just jumped on something wrong with it. What are they supposed to do to pretend it's just not happening? When I was literally falling apart and dying in front of the coronation. How old was you when you started using? Uh, properly using properly was probably 16, 17. Um, I first ever used when I was about 11. Coke because I was abused earlier on in life. Um, that was industry based, but I'm not going to go on that one. But that was another thing. That they always say you go with what you think your first thing is if it's alcohol, if it's alcohol, if it's sex, it's sex, if it's whatever it is. Uh, for me, it was Coke, and that was that. And um, yeah. Yeah. Is that product of environment as well, though? Obviously, you're in a a, a, a big arena at a very young age. Um, no, if I'm honest, it wasn't anything to do with that. It was, I was given coke when I was younger, when I was abused um, in the industry, to numb you. You know, when you take coke and it's got all that rat poisoning crap in it and you can't speak, you're like that, you can't breathe, you can't speak. That's when it's got rat poison and stuff in it. That's what they do, to give you something so you can't speak, you're numb. For me, when things started going wrong or I was getting a bit out of my depth with life and if it was going a bit fast and someone introduced me to coke again years later and I took it, bang, I was straight back there. I was numb. So when things started going wrong and I didn't really want to reach out, I didn't want scared to push the button and say, hey, I'm drowning a little bit over here. Rather than ask for help or speak to my parents or speak to my mate or speak to whatever and get a bit of support and sound it out. Um, didn't have therapy in that really back in them days, didn't you, things like that. I just went to what I knew, and it was that, it was numb. And it was the 90s, it was, you know, late 80s, 90s, it was City Boys, and everyone was at it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was ripe. Like, like was Danny ripe. Dyfield, the business, everyone was at it. You know, it was, it was ripe. It was what it was, what <clears> was doing. And um, yeah, it was so easily available to me, unfortunately. But that obviously now I look at it and I think, well, that's my path. It was, it was that was the journey I was meant to have. And when I look at things now, and people go, well, what do you want to do? And what are you doing? And you know, I've spent a lot of time. Don't laugh, Mr. Winston. When I say Often. this. But like, I've got right into like the universe and like the, the, but what's your purpose? What's my journey? Like soul searching, feeding my own soul, and I can sit with myself today. Like I said, I haven't been out of the house for two weeks. My dad died. I just need to process what's gone on in my life. But I want to be able to sit about, like on my own like that for two hours before I'd have to have had someone around me or something in with me or in me or whatever, you know. And I'm starting to just find out what my purpose is. And I do sometimes sit here and think, you know what? I've given, I've gone through this journey. What it doesn't kill you makes you stronger, in many, many ways. Um, and I think I do think my purpose really is now. I've been given this platform, and I'm still, even though I've been on telly for a long time, people still know, ask me to do things like this, and know who I am or whatever. Maybe that's my purpose. My purpose is to to show people about addiction, show them there's another way, bring them to meetings, like get them to come to meetings, or get them to get to recovery. But show them that there's a way out there. You, know, you haven't got to have money to get clean. You can go to a meeting. You know, it doesn't cost anything to sit your ass on the seat in an LA meeting and just get well. Maybe that's what my purpose is. Maybe my purpose is for the greater good, for the illness. I don't know. I know, it's, again, in, in the last sort of 10 years, I mean, I don't know how long you've been part of the programme, but... Oh, I've been off for a long time, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I've got friends who are sort of heavily involved and I would say, looking back 10 years ago, there was probably almost a bit of a stigma about it whereas now it's so open and, and available to everyone yeah of course i think, you know, I so, think mental so health has become has come a up, yeah because mental health has become more less stigmatized i think and now yeah. you know, people said about meetings and you know, going into meetings it's not um it's never been the the in thing to do you know it's not you don't go because it's, it's cool <clears throat> <clears throat> you get found out straight away if you're one of those people um but it's available it's there and it's other addicts um gone on the same journey that are further down the line than you nothing you say is going to shock them um and together we give, there's a service there there's a, there's a program that works i mean it does work if you follow the steps as simple as 12 steps and you put that every day in your life and your program comes first and i stayed clean for 14 years i need to, i wasn't of service i wasn't working the program i was clean i was going to meetings i was part of ca um i hope it's set up a wednesday meeting in Hine street i was quite very very active with it in CA and stuff at the time but um, I, did, I didn't write steps I didn't want to speak in meetings I was too so all of that time my addict was there saying oh, it was only a matter of time I was going to relapse 14 days 14 weeks 14 years 14 years bang something happened my marriage fell apart and I found it I found it you know I found it. I could be in a country where no one speaks my language I would find it in that moment if I had to so my, my addict was always there, the relapse was always there, setting me up because I didn't, wasn't working my programme. I didn't have a sponsor, I wasn't in service, I wasn't doing the steps, I was turning up. Just going through the motions, yeah, really, rather than I'm taking it serious. No, I was serious about it. I, I was serious about my... I was scared, petrified to ever use. It took me seven years into a 14-year recovery to tell me to say, I'll never use again. Seven years in. So me, everything went tits up and bang, I went out and used it in two weeks. Two weeks, my kids' lives just fell apart. How long was you back on it for? Um, I'm only four months now. Really? Oh, yeah, so this is recent. Yeah, it's really right. recent, and I've I've really um, it's been. Just, I'll be honest with you, I, I won't say it's been a struggle because I, I don't say that word anymore because I watched my dad struggle for his last breath. Spent that is when you're struggling. I won't ever say I'm struggling again after watching that. Um, it's been. Oh, what's the word I can use? to use for it it's been a it's been a bit hairy the last few weeks losing my dad and everything it was everything in me just wanted to go everything in me would have just going my addict was screaming use 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 now this is what you need you need to use relax relax and I kept thinking I can't do it can't do it can't do it can't do it and I'll, I'll be honest with you I've sat up night after night after night for like, I've gone 24 hours 22 hours and I've been awake sitting there like, literally hanging on my you think it else? Sometimes yeah. I, go, I can't. I don't want to use. Don't want to use. I've done it. I've got there. But today I can pick a phone up. I can speak to my sponsor. I can speak to people I know in recovery. I can speak to my mum. 
My mum was always there. It was me that wasn't there. My son is my best mate in the world. My brother and I are chalk and cheese, but he's there. His wife, him and his wife are there. It's me that alienated myself. So now I've got through this and I think, it's been hard. My anxiety's been really bad. With it and um, I've done it. And I've, done, I've gone through me to dad's death and I've felt every single emotion, which I've never felt an emotion for anything before because I've always numbed down everything straight away used. And uh, it's been hard, but it's been okay. Because emotions are just that, they are emotions. They don't last. They come and they go, you just got to ride them out. <coughs> but, you know, I think, I mean, first of all, well done. I mean, that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I have to say it's... But, the, some days. but do you know what? I know for a fact there will be people listening and there'll be people in the same boat, the exact same boat, and they will be, you know, they'll listen to that and they'll be like, that's that's how I feel, you know? And it's easy for people to, I'm not being rude, but it's easy for people to sit in a room and talk about their story and, and some people don't want to talk. Some people do, some people don't want to talk. There'll be someone that will be at, at home at their own time listening to this and they'll be getting encouragement from what you're saying and they'll be getting... Some people are. It's not people in a lot worse position than me, you know. Yeah. But hopefully, you know, I get a lot of people on Insta all the time inbox me about stuff, and I always say, well, what area are you in? Get to a meeting. I'll try and find somebody in that area for you. Meet for you. Just send them links and stuff, and YouTube shares and stuff to be listening to. And it's that easy, people. It really is that easy. Just go on YouTube and listen to NA shares. You really got better than like, listen to it. So it's going in and whatever whatever works for you. Meditation. I'm meditating every day, literally for the last two and a half years now. Even coming here today with anxiety, I sit in the car, but I've got these crystals, I'm breathing, breathing, breathing. It works for me. That works for me, but my programme has to come first. Mm. Like the things with the crystals and things like that, I think that That's does help people. That's all the is for me. And it does. It's, it's, you know, you see more and more people doing that. We, we had a lady on last week we were talking to, um, and she was talking about crystals and healing this and healing that. Yeah. Now, if you would have said that to me 20 years ago, I would have laughed. Yeah, of course you would. Laughed my head off. Three years ago. Three years yeah, ago. Reiki, Three years Reiki, ago. Got on Reiki, I'm repeating yeah. it in the years. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Reiki, you want to do? You want to do a massage without touching me? That'd be stupid. Yeah, you just want to take my money. Yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. It, it, would you would have thought that? Hundred percent. Now we're open to so much more. I think COVID helped us open our horizons as well and open our minds to different things. And you know, there's it's a lot of people out there suffering, and uh, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Addiction is a horrible thing for the families to go through. Horrible thing. I always feel like something they've done is their fault or partners or whatever. It's not. We just bought addicts, and, but there is a there is a there is a way out. I mean, you can have a, you can have a life. There is a way out. You just got to dig deep, and you know I'm not saying it's easy. There's days that it's hard, very hard. Not, not hard because I want to use, just hard because you just feel oh, and ashamed, ashamed that I threw away 40 years, ashamed that I've done any, ashamed this, 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 ashamed that I look like this, or all of the things. But you know what? I'm here. This is what I'm doing. Some people aren't here anymore. You just suck it up, get on with it, and do what you've got to do. Do what the book tells you to do every day. If I don't write a resentment, if I don't do my resentments every night before I go to bed, <coughs> say for two days in a row, by the third day, my I'm ready to kill something. Mm. It's really easy just doing four columns and writing my resentments. What I'm resentful about that day. Silly things like some bird pushed in front of me today, some old granny pushed in front of me at Tesco. I was fuming. What do you do? I told her. You know, so there's your column, what happened, what did you do, what did you do about it, what did they do, what could you have done differently? Well, what I could have done differently was took a big breath, it's a little old lady, could have just gone, all right, let her go in front of you. It's not the end of the world. Well, I was just simple yeah. about it. You were dead. But then you find, but looking back at it... It ain't that bad, but what yeah. could I have done differently? I see what you've done differently, you learn from these things. So. But if you don't write your resentments down, suddenly it become one big thing. And then before you know it, you're looking at all the bad things all the time. And then you, you, what you, your thoughts become things. What you're thinking all the time becomes things. So you're setting yourself up all the time for things. Positive mental attitude. Yeah, and you have to be careful because your addict will come in every which way it can. You can't get into the left, it'll go to the right, come in from behind you, come through. It'll come each way, so you think you're ready for all your triggers. I thought I knew all my triggers in 14 years. I didn't. That's why my dad died. It's been, a, it's been very hard for me, but I was petrified. Petrified is probably why I haven't left the house. He's petrified because I thought I can't go through this again. I can't go another another excuse, and it would be disrespectful for me to him for me to use that as an excuse as well. So 
you know, today I'm all right. Today I'm okay. And that's all right. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there, you know, still struggling with whatever it might be, addiction, alcoholism, whatever, you know. It's, it's hard, but you're not on your own. I think the minute you, for me anyway, the minute I become vocal about it, I'm not living in my own head with it on my own anymore. Once I'm vocal about it, it's out there, I have to do something. So once, you, once you've spoken out loud about it, then you can get help. Some people don't want help. Some people are scared because they've, you know, they've got good jobs or their family and different things. Just get to a meeting. You know, this in your lunch hour. Get to a meeting. Get on a Zoom meeting. Get on to a meeting. You know, you know, you can do it. You can do it quietly if you want to. You don't want to tell family and stuff. You know, there's like so many ways you could do it. Just get to a meeting. Get part of a program, mm-hmm. and it will change your life. And everything you're worried about, people finding out. Trust me, if you get six months under your belt, people will be proud of you. Because what was I ever worried about telling people for? I've seen people's lives literally flip turn. Like people have gone from relatively nothing to having everything just yeah. just on being in control of their own body. Yeah, I mean, it, you, like, people say, oh, you know, I've been homeless. I've been this. At the end of the day, the only place we can really live is in our own body. So we've got to start looking after ourselves. So says she, who's like, needs loads of work doing, and I've been done, I've abused myself terribly. But, you know, it's never too late to start again. And, and to be grateful and to put yourself first. And you deserve it. You deserve to put yourself first. You know, you're a long time in the ground. And people out there, you think no, nobody cares about you. No, you know, no one cares if I'm here. Or I don't I'm live or I die. Unless you just want to come down. Because you got yourself in that position. But you got yourself down. And you can get yourself out of it. Really easily by getting to a meeting, sitting your ass on the chair and just listening. Trust me, other addicts in that meeting that are a long time clean, they'll get you there. Work for them, it'll work for you. It's the support, I think, isn't it? The support yeah. network that's av- available. It is, you know, nothing you're going to say is going to shock anybody in that room. They've done the same or worse. No one cares. Do you know what, really and truthfully, we're a bunch of addicts really running there for ourselves. So don't worry about what you're saying. No, it might sound horrible, but it's true. We're there to get well. Mm. We look after each other. We're there to get well. You've got to do it for you. You've got to do it. No one can do it for you. You know? Yeah, solid advice to, to anyone who's suffering. Yeah, and you don't Struggling. need thousands of pounds to go to a rehab. So all it's going to do is just get like detox your system. Just get to a meeting. Sometimes you've got to do three a day. They say do ninety and ninety. If you can't do ninety and ninety, do seventy seven. So that like seventy seven becomes ninety and ninety. You know, just do what you got to do. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a lot of help out there. There is a lot. It sounds like there's a lot of information out there. And a lot. If you go on, if you go online, there's a lot. Then I'll, can we go back to? You was obviously at the acting school until the age of 12. What happens from 12 up till 16? So where you've... Sylvia Young's. 12 to 16. 12 to 16 yeah, at Sylvia Young's. Yeah. And that was where you then got your your first go at EastEnders. Yeah, that's why I got EastEnders two weeks before I left school. Wow. Thank God, because I was getting expelled anyway. <laughs> 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 I don't let me in for exams, I'm so naughty. Um, yeah. How was that? Well, you know, what was going through your head there? You get a, it's a major, major role. 1,200 people went up for that part. And it was over the case of the three months. It was over the course of what, three months. Then my last call back was at L Street and BBC. And I remember sitting in reception chatting to Michelle Gale because she was already in it. I knew her from Green Jill. She played Hattie in EastEnders. Um, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Mitchell sister, I was like, yeah. <coughs> she was like, yeah, you're going to be going out of Ricky in it. I was like, oh, yeah, I sort of guessed that because from where I had to look at some of the scripts and stuff. And she went, yeah, yeah, you love Siege, you'll love him. Anyway, with that, we got the upstairs to that balcony to reception. There was that little tea cafe bit there. And this great big head popped over. And we're like, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> sausage roll hanging out of his mouth. All air over each other. Really <laughs> <laughs> he went, so who's, who's, who's up for the part of my bird then? So it was me and there was another girl sitting there with her mum. Michelle went, well, Danielle is and this girl. He went, come on, let me come and have a look at yours. Like, he came downstairs with sausage roll like that. She was behind his ears. So he went, yeah, yeah, you're gorgeous. You're lovely. You're, you went, yeah, you'll do. Cheeky <laughs> <laughs> sound. He went, yeah, you'll, you'll do. I went, yeah, but will you do? And that was it. That was the banner. We was just, and then they rang me that night. Sylvia rang me that night when they're picking you up at eight in the morning. You start today, tomorrow. They bite That's my scripts over starting the next day. Excited, nervous. <sighs> Excited. Couldn't believe it. Um, just didn't even get rehearsal. I just walked on. My first scene was with Sid. I sat on a bench in the square. And he comes over and talks to me. And about it. it was, it's cute. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. And luckily, I'd already met him the day before. So yeah, we did that. It was 
two takes, I think, and that was it. Moving on to the next scene, that was it. Bang, in the bag, and from there we never looked back. Nice. Opened a lot of doors, East End, I'm sure. It. Yeah. I loved it. I loved working there. And, uh, it was different back then. It was like Arthur Fowler and all the old F4, and it was yeah. a very small cast. And uh, as I say, it was only on Tuesday night and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursdays and Sundays. That was it, Christmas Day. And, uh, institution, institution. It was. Yeah, well, that was, yeah. Was, I was going to say, like you said, their Christmas Day, like, that was like, you know, everyone, everyone watched Christmas Day. Everyone watched Christmas, watched Christmas Day, yeah, Christmas yeah, day, yeah. Dot with her Bible and her fags. Yeah. And like, yeah, I loved it. But, you know, I got to work with some absolute wonderful, wonderful legend actors, you know, legends of actors like June Brown, Panson Clement, Mike Reed, uh, Bill Treacher, so many people, Wendy Richards, so many people. Uh, you know, June Brown was just phenomenal. I used to sit there and just watch her. She used to fly around in Lexi to I, the old school then, back when I read one with Blue Stripe, fly around with this air with a purple bit in the air, and then she'd go sit and wake up in the air and go up, and in fact, I loved her. And I loved her all the way through to, to when she passed, bless her. She, she was one of the best people to sit and just watch work, because she was just so, so, like, real to yeah, watch. Like, she went from June to Dot, and it was just like, uh, and all the, everything she did with it, every mannerism as she opened the fags, everything was spot on. Mm. And then later on in life, working with Barbara, everything was spot on to all our set, everything, pictures, everything was spot on. That woman taught me more than anybody I've ever worked with in my life, or any teacher I've ever had. She taught me how to be public facing, professional with people, like even being in the supermarket and have somebody having a name badge, say, Thank you, Stephen, thank you for that, it's lovely. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Just little things about people. Uh, yeah, just worked with some wonderful, wonderful people there for a lot, a lot of years. Yeah. And is that was, I mean, obviously, that was really when you become famous, yeah. And that, you know, that, yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was. It's there, there's loads of positives and obviously loads of negatives. No, loads of positives, I'd say. Not yeah. so many negatives. God, how can you say negatives from that? It was a chance of a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it's what, especially like you say, fame back then was different to fame now, you know. Yeah, I still wouldn't call EastEnders famous though. But everyone famous, everyone knew you. You know, in EastEnders, yeah. what was the viewing figures back yeah. then? Seven million? Oh, no. Ten million? Or? No, we used to get like 12, 14 million when we were married. Oh, Christ. Yeah, it's crazy. Big, big crazy numbers, numbers then, yeah. yeah. But still, I wouldn't say it was famous. I mean, we used to just go to premieres and go, oh my God, it's Tom Cruise. That's famous. Tom yeah. Cruise is famous. But the whole of the country knew you. I was Bruce Forsyth was famous, not not EastEnders. The whole country knew you. I think that's the that's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah, it does make me feel worse. Yeah. No, but there's a few. I think there's a few people that have come from EastEnders that I I get what you're saying about famous. I I completely get what you're saying. Like you you look at Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, you say like mega stars. But but from that show, there was a few people that were kind of red hot. If you like, you know, you had yourself. Yeah, Nick Berry. He was yeah, he went to Harvard and stuff. Ross Kemp. Yeah. Yeah, and I Martin think Martin McClutchin, she yes. was massive as yeah. well. Yeah, and they and they they were they were red hot from from the show, and I remember that. I said that my right. mum, when I was nine years old, co-op in Enfield, my mum made story. my mum oh. made me queue up for about forty five minutes to go and meet Ken Barlow, the actor. Ken Roach, a massive fan. They say he's famous to me because I've grown up watching him. But well, then was. that's that's the flip for most yeah. of yeah. yeah. growing up watching yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. weird, isn't it? 45 minutes we queued up for him. I bet he was charming as well. He was lovely. Absolute yeah. ge- I'd love to turn around and say he was, but he was an absolute gentleman. Because my yeah. mum mu- was deaf, so... Oh, um, yeah, so he had so much time for her. He was an absolute gentleman, I loved yeah, it. true so professional, that's right. Yeah, I mean. yeah, good guy. But, sorry, in a roundabout way, that's what we're saying about, you know, some people were kind of flown into these megastars. Um, and I think, yeah, it was yourself, as you said, Martin McCrutch and Ross Kemp. Um, quite big a few people, some big people come through the show. You know, Nick Berry was massive at the time. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other people. So lots of people come through the, through the, the years have gone, yeah. we've done well. Like Barbara Windsor, for us to get Barbara oh, Windsor as yeah. our mum was that's like, it. wow, you yeah. know, it's huge. I can't. Huge. Just so bang the table. Just <laughs> broke it. That's it. <laughs> Smash it. Yeah, it was huge. You know, I think uh, Stephen Ross spent about two years asking for begging to get her in as our mum. Finally, yeah. let her in, and then she just changed the show. She was the Works best. So well. Well, she was iconic, wasn't yeah. she? Absolutely. Yeah, everything iconic. she did, everything she did, she was iconic. So, yeah, she was a blessing to EastEnders and to many people as well. To all of us, really. Yeah. Do you look at anything now? Do you, have, do you kind of see anything you think, oh, you know, I'd, I'd fancy a part in that or anything? Do you watch much now? Uh, I 
I do Strictly, but I don't think that that's BBC. I'd love to do Strictly. I did Dance on Ice, I loved it. Uh, I'd do Big Brother again. But acting-wise, what would I like to do? Uh, no, not really. I can't think of anything off the top of my head I'd really like. Yeah. Because it would ruin me watching it. Things that I like to watch, you know what I mean? So things I like to watch, I think, oh, yeah, just leave that as a little gem that I can watch. I love things like <laughs> that, like good drama and stuff. And if it was Sheridan Smith and stuff, I'd love to watch. So, yeah. Uh, no, not really. I don't think there's anything you know, I'd really like to do too much. Yeah. I'd like to do more theatre, really. That's where I really want to go. I want to have my operations and stuff. If I go back to work at all, I'd be doing theatre, probably. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, less money, more... More fun. Less pressure. Yeah, well, no, yes and no, but, like, you've got that contact with the audience, I think, is lovely. Yeah. Yeah, and I loved theatre when I was a kid, so, yeah, more theatre, I think. Nice. What happened with, um, obviously, when you come out of EastEnders? What was the... Well, I've been back four, four times, which one? Well, the, fir- the, fir- the first time you come out, do you think, is it like... Went, the first time I came out, I went to do ITV, to work with Tim Spool for two years, on Frank Stubbs Promotes for Colton TV, it was then... So I went out on a gold, not on a gold handshake, I went out on a deal for ITV. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing with these tenders, you can always ping in and out, unless you're, unless you're obviously killed yeah. off. Yeah, that doesn't seem to matter either these days, does it? People no, no, die no, and come back listen, anyway, yeah. yeah. Den, so, Den yeah. was in the river, mate, and he came back in that pub. Happy <coughs> Bill could die on the safari, didn't she? Exactly. She's back, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so back. So, uh, yeah, no, listen, I, I like these tenders, I love these tenders, it'll always have a big place in my heart, but it uh, would be very different for me if I went back now because no Barbara. Be a huge loss for me. Uh, not having her there. Do you miss it? Do you, I mean, do you watch it still? I don't watch any soaps. To be no. honest, I watch Corrie. That's a lie. I watch Corrie. I do love <sighs> Corrie. I love Corrie. But I love it. Well, that, that was the rival, wasn't it? When that the rival program? It's the biggest one ever, isn't it? God, Corrie. You've gone on the cobbles, where you made it. That's why <laughs> so I love Corrie. Love it. Do you um, know I've never seen a full episode of Coronation Street. Oh, was you? I swear to you, never. That's got a lovely never. pub in it, mate, and Betty's hot pot. Is that where Betty's hot pot comes from? Yeah, but she did. She ain't been there for years, though, Betty. You're joking. How long has she not been there? Well, how long has she been there? She's not like... I swear to God she was (laughs) on it last week. (laughs) (laughs) I swear she was on it. She was watching on UK Girl. Don't tell me she's not on it, because that is (laughs) it. Betty (laughs) died when I was about 15, I think. No, she couldn't have. You were saying Betty Lynch is still there in a minute. No, I know Bet Lynch ain't there. Someone else will be on the bar now. <laughs> Someone else. Oh, wait, he's a nightmare. Steve McDonald, I love him. Yeah. I just I love the characters of Corrie. It's so well put together. And, you know, it's good because it's a different soap, is it, I suppose. But Yeah. Yeah, I love Corrie. Corrie's not, the only thing I watch. Well, clearly, I'm not a fan because I didn't know Bet's not in it. Not Bet. Um, what's her name? Betty. Betty. Oh, yeah, Betty. Yeah, Betty. Yeah, Betty's yeah. yeah. yeah, not in it. No. No, good. No, good, mate. He's standards for me. That's the one really? for me. No, yeah, do like you know it? what? I've not watched it for a long, long time, to be fair. Yeah, right. I used to love, honestly, honestly, I couldn't even tell you the first thing about it now. I used to love watching it and all the bits and pieces, but not now. I, I, last time I went back to work there, I was so out of the loop because I've been living in America. I, I went back and I was like, I don't know if they were crew or the cast. I was so young. I was so young. So new, you know, so... Oh, I was just for a cup of tea. It turns out he's, in, he's yeah. actually uh, part of it. Money. I don't know. I've done that to somebody before. It's terrible. We're not, not there at a racetrack. I did it to um, Michael Schumacher once. Asked him <laughs> he was going around on a scooter on a little, one of them little <laughs> metal scooters. My dad used to love racing. So me and Sid were doing a thing racing um, and driving in XJ220s. Is it the big thing when they first came out? Nice. And it was at Brands Hatch, and it was their day before testing for Grand Prix. So it was, this is how old I was. Nigel Mance was still in the, in the seat. I didn't know he was, you know what I mean? So he was in their pits, and I was going down, and I went, can you put the kettle on for us? Well, it's a cup of tea, please, babe. And he looked at me as if saying, well, yeah, they're all pissing themselves, all the pit boys. Did you make your tea? Yeah, you, you put the kettle on, yeah. <laughs> so you really? <laughs> did, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know he was, he was <laughs> big then, he was not know yeah. then, do you know what I mean? He was like, he weren't like, he was only just coming coming up the ranks. So my dad went, that's Michael Schumacher, and I haven't got a clue who that is, not a Danny LaRue, mate, who that is. I so he said up one of the biggest race drivers ever in the world, but yeah. I bet, you went, I bet you went back and said, I've just made a cup of tea for Daniela West. I've got pictures of us like You ain't going to believe what's happening. Like yeah, ring yeah, believe that. Just like, like, oh, and he had a racing driver. He's got a metal scooter, mate. He had a racing driver. He's a cheater. Yeah, he was going over. He kind of got left on that. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so no. And then he got in the car and a fish spat. And I was like, okay, then maybe. Yeah. Sid, well, like, Sid, well, when he made us a cup of tea, it's sweet, yeah. But no, it was fun. How long was you in America for? On and off uh, for about five or six years. Yeah. yeah. 
going back three months at a time, first of all, and then at the end, about two years living there. Yeah. Was that was that work or? No, uh, my ex-husband sold his company and we moved over. We used to be there all the time anyway, had a place there in Huntington Beach in California. And uh, then we moved out. It's lovely. Nice part of the world. Beautiful. Miss it? Hugely. I wouldn't have come back. Really? So, yeah. I had to come back uh, for, obviously, we got split up and then, you know, I had to come home. I went, stayed, went back out again and then he asked me to come back, so I came back. Uh, but, yeah, I became a dog groomer. I, I had my own dog groomer. It's called Barking and Palace. Oh, you are Palace. Fantastic. Barking and Palace. It was done out like a palace. It was all British. People love the Brits, don't they? Yeah, it was good. I used to do Kobe Bryant's dogs. I used to do lots of people's dogs. My mate Steve-O from Jackass and Jackass Boys. I did lots of people's dogs and... Groomed their dogs and you know, doggy daycare, little kennels, doggy behaviour. I loved it. Dream job. Yeah, it was great. Do you know what? I absolutely loved it. I didn't see much of life because I was in there for like seven in the morning or seven at night, but I loved it. It was happy. I didn't want to deal with people. I like my animals. I'm very, I like my dogs and my animals. I'm a very homely sort of person like that. So, yeah, when I went out there, Kevin was like, what are you going to do? And I went, oh, I don't want to act. What do you want to do? I said, something with the dogs. So I went to learn how to groom dogs and... Do poodle cups and things like that. I loved it. Nice. It'd be my missus' dream job. My really? missus works in London. She'd give it all up tomorrow to become a dog groomer and it's lovely, you know. Border. Uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely. Just, yeah. It is lovely. And I think uh people, that's why my love for pit bulls came in because I fell in love with pit bulls. So you know, the bigger pit bulls over there, we're not here in this country, you're not allowed to be. But I got worse bites from chihuahuas and them little dogs people have under your arms. So they put them on the table yeah. and they couldn't stand up because they used to be carried everywhere. So I've got worse bites off there, but I loved it. I absolutely loved doing it. I loved it. It was fun. Very, very good fun. Would you do it over here? No. No? No. no. People don't spend money on their animals in this country. Not so much anyway, not for grooming as such. It's the fourth biggest income pets in the, in the, in the States. Wow. The fourth biggest um, income into America is the pet industry. I know it costs more to cut my um, cockapoos in. It does me own. Cockapoos, yeah, very Yeah. Good. So it's not surprising, yeah. mate, to be fair. That's that that looks better really, as well. I say it'll be lovely when it's finished, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be nice when it's done. Oh, don't. No, Is there anything you could do with that? <laughs> oh, no, no, I've no. got some scissors in the David kitchen. Uh, I don't no, want to talk I don't about know. it. Yeah, I don't talk about it. Bless him. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I loved it. I just enjoyed it. It was so nice to do. And it was, I got a couple of years off. Nobody knew who I was. I loved it. I was going to say, was that was that kind of one of the things that was really appealing? <laughs> That no one knew who you was. You yeah, could just, you could I just go, that. yeah. I could shout at my kids if they were being naughty. Or, you know, now, I've to do, used to do so in this country, people go, oh, look, she talks to her kids too. I think, mate, you're just being a little sod. Yeah. You have him then for a minute. You tell him off, you know, you can't do anything in this country. You'll be in, like, Sainsbury's or Asda's or wherever, for me, Asda's. And people go, oh, she only buys that fucking, she only buys Asda's own brand. I, think, I can hear you, you know. But people are very, can be very, very blatant. In this country, whereas in America, like nobody knew I was, I loved it. I didn't care. Yeah. I find this country very judgmental. We're all a bit judgmental at times. I think as well, you know what, there's a lack. Another reason I'm so glad we're doing this podcast today is I think there's a lot of, how can I say, misconceptions. So people will have a, an opinion, maybe of Daniela, from what they've read or from what they've seen without actually knowing your story. And that's why I think it's good to get you on it and get you talking and get you being you. Yeah, you I, think I mean? this is a great opportunity to be able to just say it in your own words about somebody who's middle class that works for a red top paper, working class paper run by middle class people, yeah. who's already got a preconceived opinion of you before they've even written a story or heard what you've got to say. They already know what they class you as and yeah. where they class you. Whatever comes out of your mouth, I could, I could walk down to Oxford Street and Mother Teresa with Jesus strapped to my back and they go, let's have a look at your nose. Okay, yeah. or this isn't off. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter what you do, but that's not the public's opinion. That's just the press's opinion a lot of the time, or one one mm. person's opinion, a journalist's opinion. But once it's there, it's there. It's very hard. Once it's out there, it's very hard to get it retracted. Which is why podcasts are wonderful. They really are, especially because you're not you're not journalists. Yeah, it's even better. So I think that's why podcasts have become so so popular because people like to listen to people that aren't journalists interview people. They're asking all the questions they want to know. And letting That's you talk. I watch them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously obviously, we're going to say we're big fans of podcasts. You know, it's what we're, what we're doing. But um, 
I, I'm obsessed by them. I think they've seen how they've grown over the last two years. Yeah, hugely. Or six hugely. months even. Yeah, it's really it's massive. Exploding, like the last six, yeah. nine months, it's just got even bigger. First of all, it was all because of COVID, and then all of a sudden, the last six, nine months, it's like so many different types of podcasts now as well. Mm. Um, I like it. I just think it's great. There's crime ones, there's this, there's that. It's everything you want. You almost don't need a newspaper or anything, do you? Yeah. I haven't bought a newspaper things. for 15 years, I don't think. Congratulations. Well done, you. Yeah. Proud of you. I got, you know, yeah, waste of time. I feel I'm time. a better person without yeah, you don't a need newspaper. It. You don't need yeah. it. Crazy thing is for me, I've said this a bit earlier, I don't actually like podcasts. And I don't. I really don't. But I'll see you later. Yeah, see you later. So that's me, right? I'm out. Don't call me again. Oh, <laughs> no. my God. But if you let me finish, let me finish. I'm going to redeem it. The, re- oh. the reason I love this one. Yeah, I think, yeah. I've done it. It was cut me off as well. Yeah. So you might not know. Oh, I can't Sorry. believe. What is it going to be this time? Sorry, right. So you might not know, I don't actually like podcasts. I don't like them at all. But what I have to say... Wow. <laughs> you don't like podcasts? I don't. I can't stand them. But what I will say... The reason... The reason <laughs> are you, are you no, serious? I swear to God, I can't... St- honestly, I can't stand them. I can't watch them. It's the same thing over and over. The reason I like this one... See, she's so I'm going to get it in. Because I'm in it. But secondly, I like the fact that we get people on and we're not trying to... I don't want to listen to the gangster story. You know, not be there's a time and a place and that for everyone. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. get that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in where people have been in their life, their journey, but where they are today. And, you know, in my opinion, we're in a little conveyor belt. We start off, you have your bit yeah. in the middle and all that lot. And then where we're heading towards, where we're going now. And that's what I like. I like the fact that we get people on, and we hear your story and we talk about your story and about what you want to talk about. And where we're going and where we're heading towards. And that's what I like. And sometimes I think with some podcasts, they're like, oh, yeah, when you when you stabbed up those 50 blokes, you know, that not interested, not interested. You know, I want to see, why don't you come out and say, yeah, I used to be this way, used to be an enforcer or a gang, whatever. But now I go around schools doing positive speaking. What changed them to do what that? And like where, did, where they go with? Yeah. What, where did you, you know, where did you, where did you learn from it? Yeah. And that's, that's where... I like this podcast. All the Positive rest of them, spin, yeah. Yeah, all the rest of them are shit. So. <laughs> you know what I like with yours as well is that no two guests are the same. That's right. Everybody's got a journey and they've all got... It's all quite inspirational. I'm not mind of it, but... No, it inspirational, is inspirational, like, but like, it is. You, you know, your boxing guys and different people you've had on and the people actually want to watch their stories. I'm interested. Cause some people you haven't seen for years do anything, but they're all, you know, we're all just because we're not on the telly or not, you know, front and foremost... All the time. Don't be so we're not working away in the background on ourselves. And you know, it is interesting, very interesting. And it is nice to have a journey that's uh, not just hitting on the past. It's hitting on. Yeah, I think the last you ten years. Past, yeah. yeah, like you've grown as a person the last ten years. The story you're probably telling elsewhere is the first forty years. Yeah, of and course, it's that last yeah, ten years is really what, important to us. Yeah, I'm really happy that it is because it's a whole different way of looking at things. Because. Where you're coming at it from, where the angle you're coming at it from is the angle that the people, uh, the public want to hear. They don't want to hear the last thing. Yeah, they know all that. They could probably write it better than I could. You know, they're bored, it's boring. They want to know, what did you learn from it? You know, was it painful? Was this? Was there some good bits? Did it bring you relationships? Did you rebuild relationships? Did you, you know, how did you do that? <coughs> was it difficult? You know, what did you face? And, you know, how's things today? Mm. What, are you exci- what excites you today, Daniela? You know things like that. So, yeah, you're the only people that are doing that. I think without without any other sides to you, which is very nice. It's good. I wish you the luck in the world with that. Yeah, that's Thank fantastic. And it, it, especially it, for someone that hates podcasts. I hate them. Hates them. Yeah. Hates them. They're rubbish. Yeah. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but but, on the, wow. but one thing I want to be serious about, though, and I do want to be serious, is there'll be a lot of people that'll be listening to this and they'll be inspired by what you what you're saying be inspired about listening to yourself. and they will be honestly they will be people will be listening to what they're going through in their life and they'll be listening to your story but as we're saying we're kind of saying that there's so many chapters but these are the chap this is the chapter we're on now and this is where we're heading towards yeah. um, and that's that's i think it's very important to say that because you know you talk about having the boxers on and all these inspirational people but you really need to put yourself in that category you know and that's uh, I think it was just, as I said earlier on, it's for me, I think I've been given this job as my platform, to use my platform to help people get well. 
you know, and I'm only four months back in myself, but uh, I know it's a platform I can use, and I've, I can reach a lot of people through podcasts and, you know, things like this, talking with you guys and these people being able to watch online. I can reuse my name to reach many people that other people might not be able to. Um, and if that helps someone, then I'm happy with that. I'm really happy with that. Fantastic. So, yeah. And it will. It will help people because there's so many people out there who are suffering but whether it's drink, drugs, anxiety, it's like it's sex, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah, and to see someone who's come through, and even there, what you've said there, listen, you've done 14 years and then you've relapsed, but you're yeah. back on it, you're back on it, like things yeah, that, okay. nothing's perfect, yeah. we're not perfect, oh, no I'm one's sure. perfect. I've, I've really, I've really uh, battled with it, losing yeah. my hand to that as well, the days I battle with it, <coughs> I battle to get out of bed some days, two days at a time, I struggle with it, but that's normal. That's called but going through the emotions. I'm feeling yeah. it. Emotions, emotions sit with it. They will pass. You're winning. Yeah, I'm doing it properly this yeah. time. I'm feeling, feeling but, and that's good. But do you know what? The Again, I'm not anyone to tell, give information, but one thing I will say, you know, obviously losing your dad's a terrible trauma, unfortunately. I know how that feels and so, do, so yeah. does Brett. But what I will say, the not an excuse, because I, I have been into drugs as well, so I will say... I don't want to use the word as an excuse, but that sort of trauma losing my dad, the first friend I could have turned to was also my worst enemy, which is the, is the drugs. Drink your drugs, yeah. But you, but you didn't do that. You know, you didn't do that. And you've, you've battled through that kind of hard, hard period. Do you know what I mean? And this is why I think it, it, it's different sort of this time. And a lot of people will be able to relate to that because you look for an excuse sometimes to... Listen, it would have been the best excuse in the world to use. The best. But uh, I'm just sick of hating myself. Sick of hating myself, sick and tired of just hating myself. And I, I thought I need to, <coughs> last thing I need to do is use, all I wanted to do was use, the last thing I need to do is use, because I just can't get up in the morning to hate myself and lose my dad as well. And I, I just, my kids need me. You know, they need a parent, I, you know, they need a parent. You know, I love my kids to death. I love my kids to death, but am I willing to love them enough not to die for them? Do you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. do, I love them, do I love them enough to stay well? So that's important as well, you know. So I look at that. I was looking at my dad saw me the last three months, four months, <coughs> three months. It's been a few months since he died, but last three months getting there, getting somewhere. Like you saw that light switch on again. He, that made him happy. So yeah, I, it makes me happy as well. I know things are tough some days. Everyone's life's tough some days. Yeah, it might be tough. It's, it's because I'm not picking up. Some people have it tough because they've got one arm or one leg and they've got no. No one to help them in life, or they've lost their child, or there's so many people, so many million times worse off than we I am. We say this, we often look up, we don't look down. Yeah, of course, you of know? course, and it's uh, it's all very well. So everybody knows we've been crying for tears of coming out with it. Um, it's all very well to sit and look at what you ain't got, what you did have. Yeah. But that's just going to keep you back down there. You've just got to keep going. And what you, how well you done today? You done all right today? Yeah, you fucked up a few bits today. You know, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. But you did it, got another day down, you've done all right today, you're okay. Yeah. Every day's a bonus, you know, you're getting there, you're getting to somewhere. But um, and you're never on your own, unless you choose to be. Yeah. That's so true. There's always help out there, there's always help out there for everyone. And like you said earlier, you isolated yourself when you thought you was on your own. It was yeah. actually you isolating yourself. It is, I isolate myself, and I'm very, very, that's why I have to be <coughs> very careful that when I'm with dad died, was, uh, I still pick the phone up every day to me dad, not to be dad, sorry, not my dad. To be uh, to be son, to be mum, to be sponsor, whatever. Pick the phone up, get onto an online meeting, even if I was doing it once a week instead of every day. I was doing something because I'm so close to each other on the edge of not, and it all falls one card off the other down. You know, I can't do that. I can't, I've come too far to let myself down. Yeah. So yeah, I'm trying every day. I'm trying a bit more things, and bit, I'll get through this grief and stuff as well. And it's normal, it's a normal, it's a normal it's cycle, we all go through it, we all go through it, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's alright, yeah. I'm alright. I, I said, off, obviously off camera, like 20 years last week, that since my dad passed, yeah. I don't, I, you know, it don't really get, it don't get easier. easier. No. Like it's, yeah, I think some years are worse than other years. Like it's, and yeah, even, they say times a healer, it's yeah. not. No, no, I don't think it's not. Healer at all. No. You know? to cope differently, yeah, don't grief, you? Yeah, grief, you, you find a coping mechanism to 
to get through the days and yeah, you just cope differently. It's yeah. very hard. And try and parent. Yeah, I try and make him proud. That's my thing. Thank you so much. I'm really struggling here. Absolutely like that. Too silly to be fine. Careful, because he's put right hypno on that. <laughs> Go on, then, Paul. Just to get in the body and hurry. Fucking hell, I've got a big sinex. A little clavo, clavo tissue, though. Mate, I've got emotional many times. You never, oh, what have you done? <laughs> oh, no. Big D strikes again. <laughs> Big D straight to put your motor, mate. Cross that muddy puddle. Oh, he's as bad as Sweeney uh, Todd, that boy. Right. <laughs> That's pretty serious. Thank you, Big D. He's lovely. Uh, but, uh, you didn't get me a tissue, did you? You don't care about me, mate. You've got one in your pocket, mate. Do you know, it's not. I haven't even got a thing. It's my, it's my pocket. <laughs> I've had to turn my pocket inside out to look like a gentleman. Oh, really? Uh, that's very good. Ray Winston would do that. Do, no, but do you know what? He's got the money to have one. I haven't. Yeah, he's West Ham, though, baby. I thought it was a packet of old Oban. No, no, no. Do you know what, mate? That's a little tip for you, by the way. If you, if you, this is like the life of a gentleman. If you ever go anywhere and you haven't got a handkerchief in your pocket, just reach in, get your pocket out, turn it inside out. It looks like I've got one. I like that. So, little tip for you there. Yeah, it's not practical at all, mate. Can, I can lean while you wipe your nose. Oh, that's about it. Yeah, I can wipe the last day. I wipe it with stuff like that. It's gonna be bad. Wait for me operation. But no, uh, yeah. What were we talking about? Guys, we were talking about grief. You are tons of grief, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's... it's I hate podcasts. <laughs> They're rubbish, mate. He hates they podcasts, rubbish. yeah. Actually, yeah. Mate, I can't really do stuff. I can't believe you've come out with that. I hate podcasts. <laughs> but it's true. But it, you know what I mean, though, don't you? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Can't get in around it that way, yeah. But I mean, that will be used against you. It will be just chopped up and... Well, I'm not coming back yeah, to just, <laughs> just me, just Jim going again. I hate podcasts. I hate podcasts. I hate and podcasts. thanks for tuning in. I like in. this one, yeah. I like this one. This one's all right. The rest are rubbish. But, um, yeah. Do you know what? I think it's been... I think it's been fantastic today, didn't you? Like, genuinely. I know we've had a laugh and a joke, but we've covered a lot of... She's been just want a terrible anxiety. Exactly. Terrible denial. You feel better now? I've, I've had bad anxiety until I got here. Even at the start, it was bad. Uh, yeah, I feel much better just talking, I think. Good. Thank you very much, boys. I really appreciate it. No, that is good. Gorgeous day. Oh, big, big day. Big, big day. Big bad daddy dick. Oh, yeah. Notice his hands are in his lap as well, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At least he's not back on Tinder. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very, very much. I wish you every, every success with this podcast because it is something completely unique. And it's, it's refreshing. It really is refreshing to listen to the different people, your take on things and... Thank you for having me here. No, it's been a pleasure. Sorry, I've been a bit all over the place. No, not at all. No, no, dad, but listen, you've done, you've done amazing. You know, just coming on here today, this, you know, that close to it, it's, I know how much pain you're in. Thank and we really you appreciate much. you as well. You know, We really appreciate you. Yeah. And, and We're proud of you as well. Very thank proud, you. I have to say. Very proud. I don't feel like I should be very happy. I feel like terrible, but thank you. No, no, no. All good. Fantastic. Everyone, Daniela Westbrook. Daniela Westbrook. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you so much.